and welcome into the second week of the Port Haven book club for Star Wars Most Wanted by Ray Carson. We're breaking this book down a couple of chapters at a time to talk about the themes and the goings on. Uh, one, because it's a great book, and two, because Ray Carson is writing the Rise of Skywalker novelization, which is coming out soon. Uh, so today we're talking about chapters three and four. We're right still in the beginning of the book. Everything's starting to happen. Um, and let's, let's get to it. Um, these chapters were good. They were great. Again, uh, we're still in the, the setup. So like, as I was going through and I was thinking about it, the first two chapters of the book, which we read last week or for last week, were establishing Han and Kira as characters. Uh, we were getting to know that the Han Solo that we were reading is the same Han Solo that we know, at least just a younger version of him. And then we were getting introduced to Kira and a younger Kira who we had no real chance to get to know prior to this book, uh, having seen her only in the film. So these chapters continue that. We are continuing to get to know Han and Kira. We will continue to get to know them throughout the whole book. It is largely the point of the book. Uh, but these two chapters are establishing the plot of the book, right? So now we know who the players are. Now we are going to see what they are playing effectively. So where we left off before, Kira had gone to a meeting. It didn't go particularly well. There was a big fight. She's on the run. She's darting into the sewers. Chapter three is Han's perspective. It's happening concurrently to what Kira's doing, which is something that becomes obvious by the end of the chapter. But basically Han is on his way to whatever his mission is, uh, which involves him going through the sewer. So he's starting there. Kira is going to end up there. He bumps into one of the rat catcher droids and so these are the ones that had been described earlier. They go around and catch pests and they use the pests to make the food, which is super gross. So the droids have been rigged and changed so that they can send messages and communications to each other that uh, a light on the droids that everybody else thinks means one thing actually means that there's a message. One of these droids bumps into Han and it's Sulo sending Han a, a dog biscuit and as a snack for himself. When, the, when he first gets it, you know, my first inclination is to think, oh, here's a dog biscuit in case the hounds go after you. Uh, but no, it's a dog biscuit for Han to eat. So again, it's a representation of how gross the food is that they have to eat. But then it becomes this other thing. So Han is being Han. He's supposed to go and do this thing and be at a place at a certain point. And instead of doing that, Han goes to see his friend Paolo again. What's fun in so much of this book is you get to watch Han come up with these plans. And, you know, in the films, we're just kind of living and seeing what happens with Han. In the book, we get to actually read Han's thought process or lack thereof in some cases. Uh, but he gets a biscuit and he thinks, yeah, this will be good. Oh, wait, I can give this to my friend. And then he goes, or well, the ally he was trying to make. And he gets there and he's like, oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't give him the whole thing because I will be hungry. So I'll break it in half and give it half, uh, half of the treat to him. And then as he's leaving, he's like, this could have gone really wrong. Paolo could have still eaten me and everything would have been ruined. I didn't really think that through, but oh, well, it worked out fine. Um, so I just, I really enjoy reading how Han really does do everything by gut instinct and how his gut instinct has always come through for him. And to see that to the point where this mission is like the biggest, most important thing for him to be able to kind of move up uh, and eat something better than dog biscuits, but he's still always thinking and always doing this other thing that might come in to help him. I also like that Sulo sent Han the dog biscuit uh, because so much of what we've read so far is the other people in the group are, you know, all out to compete. You know, Kira's not really out to stab anybody in the back, but she is out for herself. Uh, Rebolt is certainly not going to help them. But the idea that Sulo and uh, would, would help Han and think about Han and want to, like, pay him back for letting Han, sh or for Han sharing his food, uh, I thought that was was a nice beat as well as we get to know these characters. I also thought it was interesting with the rat catchers that Proxima doesn't know about it or at least we think she doesn't so I, I like the idea that these kids have their own way of communicating and they're doing their own thing. I also appreciated when Han is talking to Paolo um, he has this line of realizing that Paolo is speaking broken basic which is English in Star Wars but recognizes that it might not be a sign of a lack of intelligence that basic might not be his first language and it's again Han having that perspective of not everything is centered around me and how I see things and how I experience the world. And I think, again, it's coming from Han being from the subjugated group in this book, uh, where even though he's hearing a lot of basic where he's at, you know, Han mentions that he 
speak Shrilwook already in this book. So we see that in Solo Star Wars Story, he can already speak Shrilwook and he speaks very broken Shrilwook. And that is both a reference to what's coming in the movie, but also using what was in the movie to explain something about Han's character. And I, I really like how they show here that Han is this good-hearted, open-minded kind of guy. Uh, and that Solo Star Wars Story is kind of how he goes from being that trusting person to the more cynical character that we see in A New Hope, which then explains why the cynical smuggler becomes the good guy by the end of New Hope and becomes the guy that we know in the original trilogy. And just seeing like this kind of starting position for Han to understand the character that we see all the way through into the sequel trilogy. Uh, it's just, I don't know, I, I enjoy little lines like that that could seem like sort of out of place if you're not looking at it in a bigger context, but something that really grounds and explains the character where we have him now. So Han has been having this instinct to kind of collect allies, make friends in places. One of uh, such friends is a droid that he calls Tool, uh, after a specific like model type that the droid is. It's a very ancient model type. And Han makes his way into where he's supposed to be meeting a contact, sees his buddy, and then it turns out his buddy droid is the person he's supposed to meet. So it's kind of the continued intrigue of what's going on at this point in the book. Again, we see the way Han talks to the droid. He's not really treating the droid as that different. Uh, he does, throughout the course of the chapter, kind of look at, you know, oh, the droid's been improving himself and getting this part or that part or this programming and is altering how he is. But he doesn't treat his droid friend as the way he would treat the, the rat catcher, you know, he doesn't look for a personality in the rat catcher, but we see here with this droid, um, he's expecting a little bit more out of knowing him. They go into the meeting itself, Han has to introduce himself, and this is just, this is kind of a fun, funny connection. Uh, funny might not be the right word, but Solo a Star Wars Story and Most Wanted really did a lot for me in seeing the bond, the brief bond we have between Han and Rey in The Force Awakens. Han takes to Rey so quickly to the point of wanting to invite her on the ship. There And there's a lot going on there that I don't need to make this a, a video about the sequel trilogy. But besides the obvious being a father who thinks he's lost his son, uh, who might want another chance on another person, especially seeing as Rey is probably close to the age that he lost Ben at the time of The Force Awakens. I think it's also that Han sees a lot of himself in Rey. She has this kind of rough upbringing and scavenger kind of life, even though he's not really a scavenger, but even just the idea of who he is and who she is. So this line here of they're like Han, you know, Han who, uh, and he doesn't have a last name yet because he gets that in Solo, or at least he doesn't recognize the last name he would have been born with. He calls himself just Han, uh, and then he gets called Han Nothing in the meeting, which is both a reference to his naming scene in Solo a Star Wars Story, where he gets the name Han Solo, but also just a, something that kind of helps me see a connection between him and Rey. So there's a, there's a lot going on here that I think is both a testament to this book and what Lucasfilm was trying to do with Solo a Star Wars Story. I just, I get excited anytime these little bits of bobs all connect together into the same thing. There's also a funny thing about Han thinking that he came with no weapons. Uh, sometimes he gets a knife and he didn't want to bring a knife to a gunfight which is an Untouchables reference, which is an, uh, an older gangster movie. I, don't know, I, I thought it was a funny reference that was going on there. Here again, we hear more about the droid Gatra, a uh, tool huh, who's going by a different name now. And I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what was going on at this point in the book with the droid's name. I wasn't sure if it was Han always called him tool, but the droid wanted to go by Dai uh, and wasn't really forcing Han into it. And it was making a commentary on like naming or if it was just showing that the droid had two different names. So I, I wasn't sure if that was a reflection of Han's personality or trying to say something about how the droid had changed over time. Uh, but it is a distinction that Han was calling him Tool and everybody else was calling him Die. But uh, he's a part of the droid Gatra. I liked Han not knowing how to say it, like the droid God Grotto or whatever. And it's funny because when I first heard of the droid Gatra, I used to say the droid Gotra. Like I would mesh the or flip the syllables a little bit so like I could never say the, the group correctly so I just thought it was funny that Han couldn't say the group correctly but now we get to the other half of what was going on in Kira's chapter where the Gatra wins the Kaldana freak out and they start a big fight uh in this underground bunker as it turns out everything that's being fought over is a data cube so that's that's what it the kind of 
MacGuffin-esque thing that's going on. I guess it's kind of a reverse MacGuffin. They're not looking for the cube. They have it and they're going to be on the run. But it becomes the object of interest in the book. And it's kind of a mystery as to what this cube is at this point in time in the story. But whatever it is, it's enough for Tool slash Die to want to protect it. Or at least protect Han, but to make sure Han gets the, the cube. Like, not only was he dying to protect Han, but he was making sure the cube got safe as well. And so that kind of starts the the story, as it were. Han's on the run, but instead of wanting to go back to the White Worm's den, he's like, no, this is a big thing. There's now this, like, multiple-way gang war. I'm going to go back to Proxima, and Proxima is going to turn me into the Kaldana uh, to save her skin to stop a gang war. So Han is instantaneously not trusting Proxima, thinks he's on his own, and he starts to book it. Which takes us to chapter four, uh, which is Kira's perspective, and Kira is on the run. Here we see how opposite, again, Han and Kira are. Han, we have just seen, it does everything by the seat of his pants. He's planning as he goes. Kira wants to plan everything, and she has three plans for how to get through everything, and she even gets in a little bit of trouble on as she runs, you know, picking between the different tunnels she could, should go in because she's taking too long to think, which causes everybody else to catch up with her. Uh, but planning always comes through for her. And she talks about how, you know, luck is never on her side. You know, luck doesn't help her, where luck is everything that Han runs on. And so it's it's fascinating to see one character who's like, no, luck gets me through. And the other person who's like, don't trust it. Uh, and they plan their lives accordingly. But the other way they're opposite is Kira is instantly like, no, I need to go back to the White Worms because Lady Proxima would protect me. Why wouldn't she? I'm a competent, you know, indentured employee. She, she needs people like me, and she thinks about how, like, if she ran a crime organization, she would want competent people under her, not realizing the situation she's in, and that people underneath her would want power, and that competent people are people who would try to dethrone you, and that it's always a double-edged sword to have competent people working for you in these situations, uh, and that independent thinkers are not necessarily what you want, but, but Kira is so trusting. It's really interesting to see this character who is so trusting of authority and the system that's hurting her uh, that she wants to follow it and believe it and think that when she gets to the top then she will be the good uh, leader within it and then you have Han who doesn't trust the system at all uh, and so these again are two very opposite sides uh, and we're gonna see exactly how those sides play out more as the the book goes on. I do think it adds this extra layer though to Kira where Kira is so smart. I mean she's smart. She can remember keys that get put in the door and she can calculate all of these plans and she knows all of this information and she can be several steps ahead and to be that smart but have the naivety to not see how people are not out there to help her. Uh, to not have the grand kind of politics. She has all of the knowledge to be, and I don't mean politics like politician, but I mean like the 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 way to negotiate through a meeting and the, the way to see the bigger picture. You know, she can't see the machinations behind it. Even though she has so much knowledge, she would be so good at it. And I think that's the Kira we see in Solo, a Star Wars story, is the Kira who sees now how the system isn't necessarily there for her uh, but she becomes this character who's instead, I'm going to manipulate the system, even at the cost of manipulating Han. So to, to get that far. Uh, so we see her in this more naive beginning, where she still is inherently this smart character, but without, even though she lives on the street, she doesn't have the street smarts yet. Uh, and to see her there versus the character that, you know, out smarts Dryden Voss and becomes a close employee of Maul by the end of Solo. At this point she's running, she knows exactly how to get back to the White Worm's Den, she knows about this chute, and again we see all of this knowledge she has, that this is a chute that she can use, that they have access to because of this deal that they have with the other place and the thing, and she's like, she's constantly thinking and constantly aware of all of these things that are going on, and she's about to go into the chute and literally collides with Han. He's like, dude, no, we gotta go this way. And she's like, why wouldn't we go this way? And there's no time. And Han literally drags her away from her plan. And I think there's something to that as well, that Han is like 
oh no, I gotta help you. I'm gonna take you away from your plan. Uh, and that creates this kind of tension too of this, like, everything would have worked out if it wasn't for Han. And we, at this point, at least in the story, don't know if that's true or not. We just know uh, that they are together. They're on the run now. They're all caught up in it. And from here uh, becomes the most wanted. Uh, so they are wanted now and on the run. And thus truly, truly begins the book with these two truly wonderful characters. But I think that's all I actually have to say this week. I, I am, I'm astounded when I read the book. I, like, I know that it's not big schemes and you know if you look at aftermath or bloodline that we read before it's not galactic war and it's not uh you, you know the rise of the first order and that sort of thing but it's fun to see where han solo comes from it's fun to see where kira comes from i think that the smaller scale stories in star wars are so important because that's what makes the bigger stories have their weight so I'm really excited as we continue to go through this book because it really is one of my favorite of the of the new canon novels. Uh, but let me know what you're thinking about the story in the comments. I'd love to hear from you guys. For next week, we're going to read chapters five and six. So the plan is to continue reading two chapters at a time. Uh, so we'll discuss five and six next week. If you're not already, please follow us on the socials and I'll talk to you guys next week.